Okay, good luck. Thank you for joining. I just want to share with you tonight an incredible story about the power of the mitzvahs that we do on behalf of, of other people. There was, in the 1950s, there was a gentleman who uh, today is a father and a grandfather, who was then just a young uh, young boy, and he was living in Crown Heights. He's a friend of mine, Rabbi Shmuel Spritzer of Crown Heights. He told me that, um, uh, he told me many incredible stories, and uh, really, this one tops them all. It's amazing. This is the story I'm going to share with you is printed in the book called Extraordinary Hasidic Tales, which is a translation of Shmuel Svisipurim, Rabbi Rafal Kanal Vashalom, Rabbi Yol Khan's father. He wrote many stories in Hebrew, and the story, the, all his books were translated in English with some additions. This is printed there in, in Extraordinary Hasidic Tales with the uh, with a source, someone who's live today, and you could check the story with him, Rabbi Shmuel Spritzer, Zangazun of Crown Heights. So in the 1950s, he was a young boy, and he noticed this Cadillac, which was quite a um, novelty to see a Cadillac pull up to uh, this Brooklyn neighborhood where he lived in Crown Heights, said a, quite a statement about it, about the owner of the Cadillac. So he sees this fancy car and a chauffeur, the chauffeur opens the door and out of the car comes a husband and wife who are dressed very uh, elegantly. And they go into the main door of the shul and uh, the driver waits for them. And after a few minutes, they, they leave. And Reb Shmuel was wondering, who are these people? And why are they coming to 770? And he, he, the next day, he wanted to see if they'll come again. He waited at the same time. He sees they come again. And every day they come to 770. They stay there for a few minutes and they leave. And they come always with a chauffeur. And they only stay for a couple of minutes, and then they and then they leave. So he was very curious about this. And after quite some time, there was a celebration in uh, 770 upstairs in the smaller synagogue upstairs in 770. It was a bar mitzvah, 1950s, small little celebration. And the uh, this man who had the man from the Cadillac. Uh, walked into this celebration. He asked one of the yeshiva students there to help him put on tefillin. Okay, he helps him put on tefillin. And uh, the father of the Ramitsa boy asks the man to, um, to come over and join the party. The guy was a little hesitant. He didn't really want to, want to join the party. But the man was a, you know, a Hasidic Jew and he pushed him. As uh, and he's successful, and the guy sat down to the party. After he sat down for the party, he asked him to share his story. He didn't want to share the story, but he pushed him, and he finally he shared the story. It's an incredible, incredible story, mind-boggling story. Basically, this man and his wife and their two daughters. Uh, one of them was age fifteen; the other one I don't know. Uh, they were driving together, and a truck in front of them on the road knocked into, they lived in Manhattan, they were driving on a freeway, and a truck was driving in front of them and knocked into one of the electric poles inside of the road. And the electric pole landed directly in the middle of the car. It killed one of the daughters, <coughs> one of the daughters died. And the electric pole split the, the car in half, basically. It, it killed one daughter, put another daughter into a coma, and the husband and wife also had to be hospitalized for quite some time. When, the, when they recovered, of course, they were met with the tragic news that one daughter has died and the other 15-year-old daughter is in a coma. So they're really, of course, upset, but the man was very wealthy and he got the best doctors to take care of his daughter. He hired the best doctors, best nurses, but she's in a coma and the doctors had nothing really that they could do. After three months... Uh, like this, the doctors say to the parents, you might as well just take her home. Take her to your house. We can't really do anything for her here. So they bring the daughter to their home and she's still in this coma. And the husband 
has a really hard time seeing his daughter in the state, of course, and uh, he doesn't want to come home. So what does he do? He worked in Manhattan, lived in Manhattan. After he finished work, instead of coming home, he would drive around. He would drive around till midnight, just driving aimlessly around. Just he could he couldn't he couldn't he couldn't fall asleep. He was just so grief stricken about his daughter. And he would finally come home around midnight. Then he would conk out. And as soon as the sun came, sunrise, as soon as it was sunrise, he would get up again and go back to work. And he just couldn't be home with his daughter. And this happened night after night. He would just drive around aimlessly at night for hours and hours until midnight and come home and go to sleep and, and, and back to work. He had a, bi- a business acquaintance who was a Hasidic Jew. I don't know what kind of Hasidic Jew. It doesn't say in the story. But he was some kind of uh, some kind of a chassid, and he told this father, "You know, there's one thing you haven't tried yet for your daughter. What is that? You haven't tried um, going to Israel and speaking to the Hasidic rabbis. Travel to Israel and speak to the Hasidic rabbis." Now, remember, 1950 was the year that the Rebbe, uh, the previous Rebbe, passed away, and the Rebbe didn't accept the leadership of Chabad until 1951. That was wasn't that well known at the time, so. The man advised the father go to Israel and and speak to the Hasidic rabbis there. At that time in Eretz Yisrael, in Israel, there were many Hasidic rabbis, the Gera Rebbe, the Vizhus Rebbe, the Belzer Rebbe, and many others. And this man took a trip and he went to all of them. And he left quite a nice check with each of these rabbis and they gave them nice blessings. But unfortunately, his daughter's condition was unchanged when he came back. And as she was unchanged, he was also unchanged. He had nothing, he had no idea what to do. And he would just, again, continue to drive around aimlessly every night, upset, grief stricken. What should I do for my daughter? One night he's driving around and he passes by this home that has a light on very late at night. Somehow he felt drawn to this. Doesn't know why he felt drawn to this house with a light on. He comes into the house and he realizes it's not a house, it's a little synagogue, a shtibola. He comes into the shtibol, comes to the little synagogue, and there's a sofa, there's a, a scribe who's writing a Torah scroll. This man is not observant, uh, and uh, but he sees this, he knows what this Torah is, and he sees a scribe and he asks the scribe, he's just totally, you know, totally overwhelmed for such a long time. He asks the scribe, tell me, where is God? So the scribe points to the Aron Kodesh, he points to the Ark, and he says, that is where you'll find what you seek. So he goes to the Ark, and he just lets it go. He starts crying and crying, and, and he just pours out his heart to Hashem, davening and davening that his daughter should recover. He's pouring his heart out to Hashem, crying, asking God to help, him, to help his daughter recover. While he's sitting there, standing there, crying, he feels a tap on his shoulder, the sofa is tapping on the shoulder. The sofa says, how can I help you? So he tries telling the sofa the whole story. How he went to Israel and he visited all these Rebbes and his daughter is still in the same situation and he really doesn't know what to do. So the sofa says to him that uh, there's someone here in New York that you haven't visited yet. There's a great Rebbe here in New York. The Square Rebbe. Square Rebbe, the Rebbe of New Square is an incredible tzaddik. Go to him, but don't just go to mass for a blessing like you did for all the other, um, with, with all the other tzaddikim. Go to the square Rebbe and make sure he promises you, get a promise out of him that your daughter will get better. This man was desperate. Next day, he arrives in the square. He, he gets a, an audience with the square Rebbe. He comes to the square Rebbe and the square Rebbe says to him that uh, he'll give a blessing. Remember, I, I don't know if I remember mentioned the Sefer says to make sure you get a promise. Make sure he promises you that, that she gets better. So he asks the Square Rebbe, I want a promise. So the Square Rebbe said, There's only one place in the world you can get a promise. That's in Lubavitch. I can't give you a promise. So he does not. So he, okay, I'll go to Lubavitch. He goes out of, of these, this audience. He asks the attendant, the Gabai of the Square Rebbe, where Lubavitch is. And he tells him the, how to get to Lubavitch. He comes to 770 Eastern Parkway. He speaks to the Rebbe's secretary, Alva Shalom, Rabbi Chadakov. Rabbi Chadakov had a refrain for anyone who has an immediate need that speaks to the Rebbe. Um, I don't know why he did this, but this is what he would always do. 
um, perhaps it was the, the truth, <laughs> but this is what he always would say. You need an urgent speech therapy immediately? Okay, in six months, we can schedule an appointment for you. That was the always irresponsible. So he said, well, it's a matter of life and death. I can't wait six months. Rabbi Kharakov said, there are a lot of people which have questions of life and death. There is nothing I could do for you other than tell you that if it's really so urgent, write a letter to the Rebbe, I'll give it to the Rebbe right away. And if there is something that the Rebbe wants to tell you, he'll tell it to you. So he sat down, he wrote a letter to the Rebbe, gave it to Rabbi Kharakov, Rabbi Kharakov brought the letter to the Rebbe, this was on a Tuesday. Two very tense filled days later, he gets a phone call from Rabbi Kharakov in his home that the Rebbe would like to see them. On Thursday night, that night, at 8 o'clock, sorry, at 11 o'clock. They're very proper people. So though the Rebbe said 11 o'clock, they came there early. They came there at 8 o'clock. But as uh, things were very busy that night, and as often was the case, the Rebbe's audiences went to the wee hours in the morning. They didn't end up seeing the Rebbe until 3 o'clock in the morning. They were there from 8 p.m. to 3 a.m. until they finally came into the Rebbe. When they finally come into the Rebbe, the Rebbe tells the parents, I can promise you that your daughter will get better, but I want to ask you something in exchange. So he's thinking, I know what the Rebbe wants in exchange. He wants money. He's very naive. So that's what he thought. The Rebbe said, I want to ask you, turning to the wife, I want to ask you to decide every week to light Shabbat candles. She agrees immediately. Then the Rebbe turns to him and says, I want you to accept upon yourself to put on tefillin on every weekday. So he starts thinking to himself, this is too much. It's too much. It's, it's too much of a, of, of a request. He wasn't, he, he, you know, he, think about this guy who's been around the world and, and, and been to so many different people to give him advice, so many different doctors, so many different rabbis. It's too much. But his wife starts nudging him and says, listen, our daughter has already been five months in a coma. Please accept this. Nebit told his wife, please don't push him. I know the words that I ever said, but that was the, the idea. Let him, his, any decision come from his own goodwill, what he wants to do. He thought about it and he said, okay, I will do this. So Nebbe said, when your daughter awakens, please let me know. Okay, they leave the Rebbe's room. And the next day was Friday. Friday, they came to 770 and asked one of the boys there to help him put on film puts on tefillin, and he, kept on, he keeps on coming every day to put on tefillin. The following Sunday, he comes to 770, and he's very upset. His daughter is in the same state, and he writes to the Rebbe, my wife lit Shabbos candles twice already. I haven't missed a day putting on tefillin since you asked us, since, since you asked me, but you haven't fulfilled your end of the bargain. My daughter is still in this state. So the Rebbe responds very promptly and says, in the letter, in the response, when your daughter awakens, please let me know without delay. Okay. He continues to come every day to put on tefillin. And after three weeks since the audience with the Rebbe, the daughter awakens. Daughter awakens, opens her eyes. And although she was 15 years old, but she was went back to a sort of a, an eight-year-old state. And she needed to have a lot of treatment, and they asked them what to do, and they gave them specific psychotherapeutic treatments they should do for their daughter to recover. Among the things that the Rebbe said that they should do was that they should take her on a walk every day. So this man, he wasn't religious at all, but he, he decided, seeing the incredible miracles in front of his eyes, he decided that to get a, an apartment in Crown Heights on Eastern Parkway between New York and Nostrand Avenue, got an apartment there and moved there from Manhattan. And one of the things Rebbe told them was to take her on a walk every day. So he made sure to take her on a walk so that the holy eyes of the Rebbe should see her every day when he went on, on a walk. And thank God she recovered completely. And she grew up Orthodox. And she became not just Orthodox, but she en ended up uh, becoming a, a chassid of the Rebbe. As you can imagine, such a story would, would, would certainly inspire someone to have that kind of a connection. So the story emphasizes not just the incredible power of a blessing of the Rebbe, but also the mitzvahs that we do on the behalf of someone, what kind of impact they have. You do a mitzvah on someone's behalf. 
don't know if you guys saw this yet tonight, but anyone who hasn't, I want to encourage you to check out the Living Torah this week. It was incredible Living Torah I've ever seen. This Living Torah, uh, Living Torah is com- coming out for 15 years, more, 20, 20 years. This is the most incredible one. There it speaks about how God certainly gives a cure before the disease. And therefore, even though there's a new disease, I'm not sure what I was referring to in this particular talk, there's certainly a new cure for it because God does not send the world a disease before there's a cure. And therefore, the, those who need to find this cure will find the cure. And just like there is a, are new spiritual and physical maladies, there are also new, new cures. And, they have to make, and they're certain that Hashem has already sent the world a cure. And those who are looking for it will certainly find it. And then there we spoke about how when you study Chumash, the hill in Tanya, which the previous rabbi said is a key to bring salvation to yourself and all good things. It, it's something that is new. It wasn't done necessarily so long ago in previous generations, but it's something just like there are new diseases, God forbid, that also need, need to try new medicines. And therefore, how important it is to do chitas. And that living Torah, you'll see an incredible story. Uh, even doing chitas first on someone else's behalf brings a blessing to that, that person. So may Hashem help each of us and all of us to have a good tavach, a freilich a happy vach, and uh, in the merit of ourselves, merit of others, thinking more about learning Chumash Tilm and Tanya this week, especially this week is such a joyous week. We're celebrating with Avram Avinu, Lacha Chami Artsacha. It's a incredible week. It's a great time to uh, begin a new studying Chumash Tilm and Tanya. Have a wonderful week and uh, Mashiach now. Good vach. Good vach. David, good vach. Okay, good vach. Good work, Yuda. Good work, Beryl. Good work, Jonathan. Amen. Thank you.